Good afternoon. I'm Sam Pryor, Vice President of Plato. Our president, Fred McLean, was last seen cavorting somewhere in Ireland, so it's my privilege to welcome you today. It is a Plato tradition on the first colloquium of the year to honor one of our founders, uh, Arthur Milhaupt. And so the first colloquium of each year is designated the Arthur Milhaupt Colloquium in his honor. Arthur Milhaupt was a founder of the Plato Society nearly 40 years ago. He was a successful contractor who retired relatively early, became very involved in the UCLA Extension Program, and came to envision study groups designed and led by the members. Working with UCLA Extension and after three years of study and development, they launched in 1980 the Plato Society under the umbrella of the UCLA Extension Program. Arthur Milhaupt was president of Plato for its first two years and donated a great deal of time and creative vision to Plato. And he also donated the funds that supported Plato's annual Milhaupt Symposium for many years. When officially launched in 1980, Plato had 100 members and nine study discussion groups, or as we call them, SDGs. Today we have well in excess of 400 members and 23 to 25 SDGs offered three times a year, as well as an annual retreat, day trips, trips abroad, newsletter, colloquia programs such as this, and many other activities tied to our members' interests. For those of you who may not be members of Plato, what makes us different from other continuing education programs is, as Arthur Milhaupt envisioned, that we are a group of people who, as you can see from peering around, are largely over 30. <laughs> <laughs> who love to continue to learn and thrive on doing so in small, engaged, congenial, peer-led discussion groups. You can get more information about us from pamphlets on the tables outside or by going to our website at, the, at theplatosociety.org. It is now my pleasure to introduce the chair of our colloquium committee, Jay Rakow, who will introduce our distinguished speaker. Good afternoon. Today, we're very pleased to have uh, Kathleen McChesney as our speaker. We're very pleased to have Kathleen McChesney as our speaker. Uh, Kathleen began her career, has a, a very long and distinguished career in law enforcement. She began her career in the Seattle Police Department, where for those of you that are fans of Law and Order SVU, that's the unit type she was in. She was a detective in the uh, unit handling murders and sex crimes. She then went on to a very distinguished career in the FBI, uh, winding up as the, she was the head of the field office in Chicago and in Portland, Oregon. She was the head of the FBI's International Training Academy and ultimately became an executive assistant director, uh, which is the third highest position in the FBI. After leaving the FBI, she worked in the private sector as vice president for, of global security for the Walt Disney Company. Um, in response to the sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church, uh, Dr. Mc Chesney was hired uh, by the Catholic Bishops Conference to establish and lead their office for child protection. She developed and oversaw a national compliance program uh, to ensure that the diocese had a policy and, and um, applied the policy. She also coordinated a major research study into the nature and scope of the problem of sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, and she's published and lectured many times on the issue of sexual abuse of minors in youth organizations, or youth-serving organizations. Uh, she's a member and uh, chair, and was a chair of the National Advisory Council for the U.S. Conference of Major Superiors, male, 
and has been on a number of uh, boards over the years, including the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the Foundation of Former Special Agents of the FBI. She's received a number of prestigious awards, including the President's Award for Distinguished Public Service and the Lifetime Achievement Award of the National Center for Women in Policing. Uh, she is co-author of two books, Sexual Abuse in the Catholic Church, A Decade of Crisis, which came out in 2012, and Pick Up Your Own Brass, Leadership the FBI Way in 2010. She has a PhD in public administration from Golden Gate University, a master's in public administration from Seattle University, and her bachelor's in police science and administration from Washington State University. Um, we're very excited to hear from her today on this very, very timely issue, uh, and we thank Hang Zangwill, my predecessor, for having the vision and foresight to know this was going to be such a timely issue six months ago when he arranged this. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Kathleen McChesney. Well, thank you, Jay. Now, I'll do the microphone check, since you didn't, <laughs> and everyone was calling. You Can everyone hear me in the, in the back there? Is this good? Okay, great. Thank you. And thank you to the society. Thank you, Sam, and all the members for inviting me here today. It's always a pleasure to talk about something that I'm passionate about, and the way we protect children in our society is is almost at the top of, the top of that list. And as, as Jay indicated, we didn't know six months ago when Peter McDunn and I were having coffee, and Peter said, would you like to uh, maybe talk to the Plato Society sometime in the future? And, and um, we, you could talk about sex abuse in the church, and I said, you know, people are kind of tired of that topic. Uh, it's, it's, you know, in 2002, people were really talking about it, and now uh, not so much. Um, and he said, well, you believe it's important, and I do. And so whether it was in the news this week, last week, or, or never again, I think it's a topic that's important. I suspect that a few of you, maybe many of you are Catholics, uh, some of you of other faiths, some of you of not of any particular religion, but all faiths serve youth. That is part of what you do. And so it's, it's extremely important that the way you treat youth and the way you care for them is part of what you do as, as adults in your faith group. The this particular cover from Time Magazine is actually about 15 years old, but, but they could put it up today, if, for those of you that might not be able to read it, it says, can the Catholic Church save itself? Well, certainly the Catholic Church is all about saving souls, but can it save itself? And that's probably, uh, a question that I can't answer for you here today, and, and maybe there's no one who could really, really answer that. But it's something to keep in the back of your minds as as we're talking about sex abuse. And I want to give you a little bit of context about sex abuse. First of all, sex abuse in general, and then more specifically in the Catholic Church. I'd like to tell you what the Catholic Church has done recently uh, about sex abuse, preventing abuse, responding to it, and being held accountable for acts of abuse by, uh, by clergy. And I want to talk to you about things that people need to do going forward to protect children. And why, why is that so important? Jay talked about my rather lengthy career in law enforcement, and yes, I'm one of those who are on the other side of 30 in, in terms of age. So I've, I've seen a lot. I've been involved in law enforcement for uh, nearly 40 years. I've been inside of prisons. I've been inside of juvenile justice facilities. I can tell you without a doubt that those facilities are filled with men and women who were abused or neglected as children. The, the percentage of children, uh, young people, minors in juvenile justice facilities who've been abused is at least 85% reported. It is, it is a huge problem and if some of you probably come from social science backgrounds and, and you know that 
how you nurture a child and how you protect a child is so influential on the individuals that they become and how they treat one another. How you treat the child is very often how the child treats other people, both as a child and as they become adults. So this is a, a terrible problem, neglect included, but, but uh, particularly in terms of physical abuse and sexual abuse, you, you can pick up a newspaper every day of the week and you could read about some strange people somewhere that that have that are, are living in a, a a mud hut and abusing you know all kinds of children that have grab that they've managed to um, get their hands on. There are these things going on every day in our society. We as adults need to be aware of that. We need to be alert for it. We need to know when there's something that, that we should say something about to law enforcement, to a school principal, to someone in authority, to a, a, a pastor, a bishop, a rabbi, or whoever it might be. Sex abuse is the most underreported crime in the world. It is just so difficult for people to come forward for a variety of reasons. And when I talk about sex abuse, uh, it can make some people uncomfortable because in most groups, there is at least one person who has either experienced abuse or someone in their families experienced it or they know someone who uh, was a predator. And so I'm, I'm sorry for those who, uh, of you that have had those experiences. I don't think anything I say will make you particularly uncomfortable, but certainly when I'm finished speaking, you know, you can tell me privately that, you know, maybe some of your words could have been chosen more carefully. I hope not, because some of these words you, you do need to hear. And once again, sex abuse, the most underreported crime in the world. Why don't people come forward? And now, you know, even since um, Peter and I spoke about my coming here today, the entire Me Too movement has has taken hold. And people are reporting cases from years and years ago. And why are they reporting now? Primarily, the number one reason why people report is because they know somebody else was victimized by that person as well. That is the thing that gave the boys who were abused by Jerry Sandusky a voice. They came forward once that they heard that Jerry Sandusky had abused uh, a variety of, of um, unfortunately, troubled and, and very vulnerable adolescents uh, there in State College, Pennsylvania. When one boy knows that another boy has the courage to come forward, they don't feel alone, and they, they think that they'll be believed, and they don't think that they'll be blamed. One in four, these are the current statistics, one in four women in the United States has either experienced sexual abuse or an attempt at sexual abuse. And this, this comes from some very good studies. And one in six men or boys have experienced abuse or someone who tried to abuse them sexually. That is a lot of people, when I, when I share that statistic, a lot of people say, no, no, it can't be, it can't be. I have 20 friends, and that would mean four of them someone tried to do something to. Well, you need to think a little bit more closely. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, full-blown physical assault in each of those cases, but someone who grabs someone uh, inappropriately, uh, th that, that counts as an attempted attempted abuse. So it is very prevalent in this society. Where it comes to be a huge problem, of course, is when it is sustained abuse by someone uh, in a position of trust to the child. Um, stranger abuse, uh, the stranger danger that a lot of us probably grew up with, you know, don't get in a car and, and those sorts of things. Uh, that is not Often it is not as impactful as sustained abuse by a parent, a step parent, uh, a priest, a teacher, because the child has learned to trust that person. And that's a whole different relationship than being you know, grabbed off the street uh, and, uh, and assaulted. Both are bad, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's a different psychological impact. Uh, and in the case of 
clergy abuse. The impact is not just psychological or physical, but it's also spiritual. And we have found that with uh, many of the individuals who were abused by Catholic clergy, these were people who were, these were boys and girls who were involved with the church. They were altar servers, they were in music ministry, their parents were and families were active in, in church. They went to Catholic schools. So these are people who believed in the tenets of the church and they also, many of them believe that their offender was really Christ-like, was really represented God on earth. And so the impact of the abuse was uh, something that I have not experienced it, so I can only say we, we can only imagine if we haven't experienced it ourselves. And I mentioned some of the reasons why it, sex abuse is uh, the most underreported crime in the world. In, in some countries around the world, reporting abuse can, can turn around on the person making the report, and they can be subject to all kinds of civil punishment um, for doing so. Because here in the United States, I hope that we have come to that point where we realize you cannot blame the victim if they've been a victim of abuse. Some victims, yes, they put themselves in harm's way by making bad decisions about where they're going to go or who, they, who they're going to spend their time with. But it is not the victim's fault. It is not the survivor's fault. I'm not here to defend the Catholic Church. I, um, the, I'm the last person they would ask to do that. But I, I want to give you a, a broad picture so that you do have context about abuse uh, around the world and in society. In society, if you have, and I know you are a group that reads, so you will know if you've, if you've read any newspapers uh, in the last couple of years, there are cases of sex abuse in schools, in prominent schools like Penn State or Michigan State. There are prominent programs that some of you or your families may have been involved in, whether it's USA Swimming or gymnastics, where there has been rampant abuse by someone. And you know, why wasn't, why wasn't that seen? Why wasn't it stopped? People often ask me, why did so many girls get abused by Dr. Nasser? And I say, because they thought they were the only one that was being abused. It wasn't like he brought 10 of them in the room and abused all of them at once. It was one at a time. And he hid his acts of abuse under the auspices of providing care and therapy. And what does a 12-year-old girl know about medicine, about getting better? All she knows is that she wants to compete or she's being urged to compete. So these cases go on everywhere, everywhere there, where there's youth that can be um, in a situation where they're un, uh, there's not supervision of other adults, where it can be one-on-one -on -one contact. Happens in the camps, it's happened in nursery schools, it happens in other, not just the Catholic Church, but other faiths, public and private schools, um, and I work with schools and I work with um, faith-based organizations and youth organizations uh, on conduct matters. So I can tell you that the problems are the same th throughout. And I urge people to pay attention to that, that um, while we're focusing on the Catholic Church, and that is, that is good, but we also need to focus more broadly on, on society. And then last, I will point out that there is a um, a certain amount of sexual abuse, certainly neglect and physical abuse that goes on in families and in step families and in extended, you know, quasi family situations. Uh, that, for those of you, once again, who are have fields in psychology and sociology, you know that that is the case, that there are people who've been abused in their own families. And often those are the very last people who will ever report. They will just live their lives in. Um, and perhaps you know require therapy as they as they um, realize what damage it might have done to them. 
And it's not just the United States. A lot of people think, well, sexual abuse by the priests, that's just here in the United States. Uh, but it, that's not the case. These are just some of the countries where sexual abuse of children by priests have taken place. And the kind of a little bit late to the game, so I, I, I can be critical of, of my own my own faith here. But um, it has taken some years to get the Vatican, the Holy See, the, the the head of the Catholic Church, to have universal programs relative to the prevention of abuse, because cultures are different, and and I understand that cultures are different in in. Um, Africa and Asia with regard to the age of minority, with regard to you know other cultural things. But nowhere, nowhere is sexual abuse of a minor uh, anything but a crime. The, since I was, <laughs> since I'm uh, talking in, in not fond terms or, or flattering terms rather about the Catholic Church, there, there are some very medieval things about, about this church that some of you may know and some of you uh, may not. Uh, this particular slide is St. Is Peter's, uh, which is the Holy See, the, uh, the Cathedral of Rome, and next to it is the, the um, what they call the Palace of, Palace of the Popes in Avignon, France, where for uh, almost a century there was another set of popes that, that weren't in Italy. But by and large, the Catholic Church has been uh, ruled from from Rome, and we'll talk about talk about the Holy Roman Empire. I'm not going to give you a history lesson here. I know that many of you um, are really very good at history. I'm just going to give you a little bit of blurb so you can see how slowly the Catholic Church works at doing things. Uh, and if, if, if uh, we believe that St. Peter is the head of the church, we're talking about going back for, for um, a couple thousand centuries, 2,000 years. Uh, and I put the next bullet point up, which just is to point out, in the year 306, in the fourth century, you're talking about how many centuries ago, the church first established a law against abuse of free children. And I thought this was really interesting. They established a law and a punishment of spitting on the offender, of tying up the offender, of doing some things that were, you could uh, equate to a punishment. But what, uh, one thing I thought was really interesting was abuse of free children. What is a free child? And in those days, that would be a person who, a child who is not a slave. So in, the, in that century, in the fourth century, Slave children, it was okay. There wasn't a punishment uh, at that point in time for abusing children. Fast forward a couple hundred years, and the church reiterates law and increases the penalty from spitting to death penalty. Now, I don't know, I, I haven't done enough research to know if there were a lot of cases where people were murdered for sexually abusing a child, but um, that will be an interesting thing. That would be an interesting thing for me to find out. Fast forward again, and this is all church time uh, to the 12th century. That is when the Catholic Church um, established a celibacy mandate for its clerics, for priests, and not for the deacons, but for the priests. A lot of people ask me, is the problem in the Catholic Church because of celibacy? And the answer to that is no. There are a lot of people who are celibate. Uh, they choose to be, or that's just the circumstances of their lives, and they're not predators. Celibacy can lead, though, to lack of intimacy, lack of good adult-type adult relationships, and loneliness. And those types of things can cause a wide variety of misconduct. The Catholic Church must have liked the celibacy thing because they reaffirmed it uh, uh, several hundred years later. And I'm told, I'm not an expert in this, 
um, but I'm told that part of that had to do with the um, Catholic Church wanting to maintain the patrimony and the riches of the church. So if a priest were to marry and have children, then he would be taken away from some of the resources that uh, some of the church leaders wanted to retain for themselves. Then another several hundred years before there's a, a significant change that affects uh, what we're talking about today, and that's the Second Vatican Council, which was in the 1960s. And the idea of that council was to find ways to provide better ways for people to connect with the church, to make reforms in the church. And that was a time when, frankly, uh, a number of men in seminary uh, left seminary because they thought they were going to be able to marry, and then they weren't. So in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, there's a high percentage of exits from some seminaries lost as many as 50% of their, of their students. And then 2002. And uh, that was the, the breaking point, if you will, in the Catholic Church in the United States, sexual abuse crisis. It had a name. It had the attention of everyone. Within a, about a 14-month period from January of 2002 until the middle of 2003, there was an article or a news story about the Catholic Church abuse every single day in the United States. And I know that the church keeps track of that sort of a thing. And it was devastating for everyone, for lay Catholics. It was devastating for priests who had not been abusers. But first and foremost, it was a reminder to people who had been abused. While they were surviving their abuse, for some people, it was kind of like living it all over again. A lot of things happened that I'm going to talk about since 2002 to make things better in the church. And then what happened this year was a different sort of a thing. Uh, a couple of months ago, the, the uh, Attorney General in the state of Pennsylvania came out with a grand jury report and described cases in six or seven dioceses in Pennsylvania where there had been abuse over a period of years. We knew that. Um, they didn't bring new information forward, but what they did describe was the types of acts that had happened and some of the acts of the bishops and other church leaders when they when allegations would come forward. Add to that, a very prominent cardinal in the United States was accused of abuse not only of seminarians but at least of one minor child over a period of time and you know it's not necessarily the crime sometimes it's the cover-up that gets people's attention and in this case people are demanding to know and the answers aren't there yet people are demanding to know how could someone who has abused seminarians or or in this case uh, a minor, be promoted to the highest levels of the Catholic Church. Did nobody know what was going on? And I wish I had the answers to tell you, but um, th there hasn't been a proper investigation, whether it will be done by attorneys general, whether it will be done by the, the Vatican, or whether it will be done by the U.S. bishops. I'm not sure. Um, all I know is they should stop thinking about it and, and find out. Just for a show of hands, how many of you saw the Spotlight movie? So quite a few. Uh, Oscar-winning movie, uh, more in some ways as a documentary than than a entertainment film for sure. But that movie, having you know lived through part of that period uh, while working f for the bishops, was right on. I mean, it was, there was some dramatic license, but uh, by and large, the, what those reporters did was such a service to the Catholic Church. And uh, I know that a lot of people 
church leaders thought it was the worst thing that could happen. It was the best thing that could happen. You shine a light on what is wrong if you want to purify it. And a lot of church leaders just didn't look at it that way. But over time, I really believe that some of the newer bishops uh, and some of the more senior ones realized that this mess had to get out in the open to get fixed. I want to talk to you a bit about the offenses and the offenders. The, the Catholic Church did a, a huge study uh, in 2003, they enlisted the John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York City to look at the nature and scope of the problem. When I got to work at the Bishops' Conference, which was in 2002, I had been asked to leave the FBI, where I was. I had a really nice position, and I, I worked for Bob Mueller, whose name nobody knew until last year. Now everybody knows who Bob is. <laughs> and I, they say, who's your boss? I say, Bob Mueller. And they go, oh, okay, who's that? Um, but Bob and our team uh, were doing some tremendous things relative to um, the response to 9-11, which had only been um, a little over a year previous. And I was very excited about our, our new initiatives. The, in the, I know I'm digressing here, but just to give you context, in the, um, since the first bombing of the World Trade Center in the early 90s in New York City, terrorism had been uh, the number one priority of the FBI. No one had the imagination probably to think that what happened on 9-11 would happen, but, but it did. John Jay College of Criminal Justice is in New York City, and they are not a Catholic university, but we believed that they had the expertise to do a study on, on the problem of the nature and scope. When I went to work for the Bishops' Conference, as I started to say, Nobody knew how many cases there were. Nobody knew how many offenders there were. Nobody knew how many survivors there were. So this study, which they, the bishops agreed to fund, um, we said, we'll fund it. And they naturally thought, OK, we'll find a nice Catholic university to do the study. And we pushed back on that and said, no, you can't count your own cases. You're going to have to get uh, a secular university to do the research, and they did, and they did a, a, an excellent job. But we knew, as they did their work, that all the numbers wouldn't be there. Why? Because, as I said before, sex abuse is the most underreported crime in the world. And certainly in the United States, it's very well under underreported. So we knew the names wouldn't be there. We knew people still hadn't reported because there's about a 20-year reporting lag between the time someone uh, gets abused and reports. And in the Catholic Church, what we found amongst a lot of the survivors who, who didn't report initially, besides saying they didn't think they'd believe, be believed, besides saying they didn't think that um, they thought that they would be blamed, some of them thought that they couldn't tell anyone until their parents were deceased because their parents wouldn't believe, either would believe them or would be so devastated and lose their faith that the children carried the burden of not sharing what had happened to them. So that's a very unique thing about victims of, of clergy abuse in the church that they, they just didn't report. And then there were some who did not want to report until the offender was dead. And the reasons they give for that is, you know, he was a nice guy. He did good things. I don't want to, him to, to have to go to jail. I don't want him to have to um, do anything but the good ministry that he does. So it, this is a very complex issue when you're talking about abuse of minors in the church. When John Jay did their study, um, they found that there were at least 15,000 boys and girls who had been abused. And in subsequent years, because now the Catholic Church does keep track of the reports and the numbers of people who report abuse, and they're published every year, and not very many people are interested in reading them because it's kind of an older topic, but there are at least 18,000 
uh, who have reported abuse, mostly between the years of 1952 and, and um, and currently that they did report. Um, that wasn't when the, the offenses occurred, however. Of those 18,000 people, about 5,000 different clerics were named as offenders. 5,000. What that means, and that is a, a staggering number, um, it it's consistent with sort of percentage-wise of sex offenders in society, but doesn't matter. Uh, I, I just tell you that for a, a little bit of clarity. It does not matter. There should never be a Catholic priest, deacon, anyone in Catholic ministry, anyone in any ministry, anyone in a school, church, youth serving an organization who abuses a child. So if the number were one, it would be horrible. In this case, 5,000, and in this case, these are, um, a majority of these people are, are deceased now, but they represented about 4% of the clergy during that time frame, 4%. And once again, that's not all that different from sex abusers uh, throughout society. Um, you just need to look at your sex offender registry that some of you may not know is there, but you can go to you can go to the sex offender registry and find out if sex offenders are living in your neighborhood or in your children's neighborhood or in your grandchildren's neighborhood. And that's a really important law that was passed and um, the information is out there. People don't look at it. So when did these 18,000 cases occur primarily. If you read the uh, Pennsylvania report, you would think they're going on right now. That's not the case. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't cases e each year. There are some cases that, that occur. But most of these cases took place between 1960 and 1984, with the peak year being 1975. So why was all that abuse going on then. Well, first of all, you didn't have programs and policies. Um, you would think you don't need a you don't need a, a, a rule to say you can't abuse a child if you're a cleric. Well, some people obviously needed needed some clarity there. But the in the 60s and 70s, um, there was a lot of relationship between uh, families in the church and priests, and people held priests in very high esteem. This was the person that you would want to take your child on a out of town trip, or to a basketball game, or to a movie, or to dinner. This is a person who you'd often ask to babysit because they like children. Who, you know, who's going to be safer than a priest? This was part of the culture of the time, so the opportunities for abuse were very high. You also had uh, a lot of trust uh, in what kids did. If kids sometimes wouldn't be seen by their parents, you know, after school and they'd come home for dinner. Well, where were you, you know, between 3 and 6 p.m.? Oh, I was here, I was there. We w did not have an awareness of abuse like we do now. There, that just did not exist in society in the in the 60s and and to a great extent in the 70s. Uh, as a a detective uh, working with special victims, I would see things, and I was you know relatively young as a detective. I would see things that I would just I was absolutely stunned that people did to one another or to their children. I just could not believe that, that um, the, the sadness. I, I do remember walking into a, um, a home, uh, uh, what had happened, and I'm gonna digress a little bit, but it, it was a, a report of a rape, and, I, and my partner and I got that on our, our desk in, up in Seattle. And so we called the woman who had reported the rape to go interview her. And no answer, no answer, no answer. So we went to um, the home and went in and the door was, front door was open. It was kind of a, a bit of a ramshackle home. And knocked on the, you know, kind of pushed the door open and this eight-year-old girl came out and I'll never forget her name, Donna. And we said, you know, is your mom home? And she said, no. How about your dad? No. How about 
a caregiver? No. Um, are you by yourself? Yes. And she was trusting enough to kind of let us in. We went into the home and there was no running water, feces everywhere. Um, it was the most disgusting, vile place, you know, old food wrappers and things like that. And of course, as, as law enforcement, our responsibility is to remove the child immediately from, from that situation, which we did. And when we took her to foster care, she, the last thing she did, and my partner and I are standing there, and he's a, you know, a big guy, and he's, he's uh, pretty macho, and she ran up, and she, it was, she was shown her, her room. She had her own little room there. It was all clean and nice and tidy, and she threw her arms around his legs, and she said, thank you for bringing me here, and it's like, how bad was her life? Well, we'd already seen it. But the, um, in, in those days, neighbors, you know, we went and talked to the neighbors and we said, why didn't you call? Well, it really wasn't any of our business. You know, we knew that the mother wasn't there much. Um, it is all our business to protect children if we see something's going on. So that was just an advertisement, uh, if you will. The, the, the victims, the survivors of abuse in the Catholic Church, those who were abused by priests, tended to be between the ages of 11 and 14. It's been often said, oh, priest, abuser, pedophile. For those of you, again, in social science backgrounds, you know that a pedophile is attracted to a prepubescent child. Um, and that's a very small end of the spectrum. There aren't many cases. These aren't like baby abusers. By and large, these offenders, their targets were victims in the adolescent years, ages 11 to 14, where they could still exert power over the, over the victims um, because they were older, stronger, bigger, and because there was lots of interaction between boys, of, uh, boys and girls uh, of this age with, uh, cl with clergy. And 85% were boys. And there have been some studies, there's been a lot of meta-research on whether or not homosexuality is related to abuse of, of children, abuse of uh, adolescents, or abuse of older teenagers. Nothing is definitive uh, at this point. Uh, you can make up your own mind about that. What what John Jay College said in a subsequent study was that mostly this was a matter of opportunity, that the place that these predators could be alone with children, with minors, was, um, was uh, there were lots of opportunities for them to be alone, and more opportunities for, for them to be alone with with boys, because boys were altar servers in this, those days. Uh, priests took the boys on different uh, activities, and there was a lot larger uh, women's religious um, population at that time. So girls would be with women religious often, and boys would be with, with the priests. So what happened to these young people? Well, there's an entire spectrum of abuse that has occurred. There, there's attempted abuse, fondling, sort of sex games, all the way up to forced sexual and anal intercourse. And uh, I know that the Pennsylvania Grand Jury highlighted, highlighted some of that. Um, most, most of the abuse was um, fondling fondling either over the clothes or under the clothes. That, that was the majority of what it was. It was not uh, forced intercourse. Doesn't matter. It was all abuse. So fast forward to this spotlight time and 2002. And prior to 2002, uh, in the late 80s, uh, a lot of the dioceses, Catholic dioceses around the country, actually established programs to prevent abuse. They started providing uh, consistent assistance to peace, persons who came in and reporting abuse. But prior to 2002, often the church just ignored 
the person who was reporting the crime. They would listen, maybe, and then that would be it. Okay, thank you very much. Ignored it. Didn't do anything about it. Or they would cover it up. They would find a way to hide the allegation, or they wouldn't write it down. Um, they just did not make a record of it. It would all be whispers and, and secrets and, and um, nonverbals. Or they often blamed the victim, uh, particularly if the victim was a girl. That 12-year-old is flirting with father, she can't leave him alone, etc., etc. That 15-year-old wears those short skirts, what did she expect? And I see these, you know, uh, records and files all the time as part of my, my consulting work for youth serving organizations and churches. And it, blaming the victim has been um, part of our culture. I am sorry to say that sometimes we see new cases, whether they're adult on adult cases or not, but blaming the victim. And that is not what the church is. It's not what we should be as a society. The church often settled cases. A family would come in and say, my child has been abused, and maybe they'd bring a lawyer, or the church's lawyer would do, would do the response and say, well, you know, what will it take for this problem to go away? Um, and often they would say, well, can my kids go to school, Catholic school tuition free? Uh, can we have a small pittance? We know the church is poor. We don't want to take your money. But there would be settlements of, of some sort. Sometimes the settlements included this. Uh, you will send father to treatment, right? Oh yes, he's alcoholic, he doesn't, um, he doesn't do these things, but when he's you know, back, back on the sauce and we're gonna treat the alcoholism or we're gonna treat his psychological problem. And then they transferred him to uh, maybe another parish in the area or maybe to another diocese uh, or to the Pacific Northwest or sadly uh, one, one religious community sent a lot of their offenders to Indian reservations and the, the rate of abuse was very high. The Northwest province um, of the Jesuits went bankrupt uh, very much in response to the cases that were um, from Alaska and from uh, South Dakota. So after um, the Boston Globe and the revelations there, which uh, I give one more shout out to the to the media. Um, I'm a big believer in in maintaining a free press and and the in the. Um, the initiative and the talent of some of these investigators, uh, investigative reporters. But what the bishops did then, when they went into, they, they really finally believed, okay, this, this is something we all collectively have to do. There are 195 um, bishops who are heads of diocese in the United States and about another 100 or so bishops who are retired. And they meet a couple times a year. They met in Dallas in 2002 and they said, we have to do something. And what they did is they promulgated uh, a charter for the protection of children and young people, which sets forth certain standards that they all agreed to meet. Uh, for the standards for the prevention of abuse, standards for the um, response to people who report abuse and how to report that they are to report to law enforcement because they weren't doing that in the past unless they were mandated reporters. And um, accountability of priests, meaning remove priests from ministry, even with one act of abuse of a child, they're gone. And the uh, transparency, letting people know what they're doing. Um, in the transparency piece, that's been, um, some of the bishops would say it's a struggle. I don't see it quite that way. If you have an offender, you name them um, because you, your job is to protect other people. So this charter was developed, everyone adopted it. Uh, in addition to this, the bishops went to the, the Holy See, the Vatican, the, the place that's the folks are in charge of the church, and they said, we want church law that 
more or less codifies this charter that we've just developed. And the Pope uh, said, yes, we're, we will do that. We will create canon law that just for the United States, as if this wasn't going on around the world and in a church that calls itself universal. That's kind of stunning to me, but uh, things are changing uh, gradually in that regard. Another thing that the bishops did at that point in time was they established a national review board. They brought in lay prof professionals to give them guidance and they listened to them. Not always, but they listened to them. Governor Frank Keating from Oklahoma was the first chair of that board. Leon Panetta was on that board. Uh, Justice Ann Burke from, um, uh, who's now with, on the Supreme Court of uh, the state of Illinois. Some very prominent folks who were educated, who knew how to deal with crises and who knew how to prevent um, misconduct from occurring in the future. And that board, that board there are different members now, but um, has been in place for the last 15 years. And then they established an Office of Child Protection as somebody to come in and make certain that all the things that the bishops said that they were going to do going forward were done and it helped develop programs and ensure that priests were removed from ministry who should have been removed. That was my job. That was what they asked me to come in and set up. And that, that position is, is, is still there. Um, and one of the, we did a number of things, um, got the studies together. We, did, we set up an audit program where every diocese in the United States, every Catholic diocese is audited every year to make certain that they are complying with that charter. And if they're not, and there's an annual report, and if they're not complying, they're named in the report. For the first couple of years, people were pretty interested in it. And, you know, over time, it's not, it's not that interesting because most, most everybody is doing all the reporting that they're supposed to do. And um, all the other, maintaining all the other programs that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So if we fast forward again to today, where, where is the church right now? Where the church is, there has been some progress. And um, other organizations have looked to the church to say, well, how did you establish these national guidelines? How do you enforce them? What are the punishments associated with it? What do you do for people who re report abuse? What kinds of codes of conduct do you have? Those are things that the Catholic Church, sad to say, was forced to do in 2002, but did and brought in professionals to help them do it. So their outreach programs are, are quite good. Uh, didn't used to be, but professionals, psychologists, social workers, and so forth, work with survivors of clergy abuse and also can help them with pastoral care. That's another component you don't see necessarily on the secular side, but for many of these victims, as I said before, they were involved in the church. Some of these persons have said to me, I got through this, I survived because of my faith. And then another would say to me, I have no faith because of what happened to me. The outreach people uh, who are working on behalf of the church now understand that and can be very helpful. Some people come in and say, I want to come back to the church. How do I do that? How do, how do I get over my pain and, and be part of something? The average abuse victim now of clergy abuse in the United States is probably about 68, 69 years old, uh, many times older. In each of the churches, uh, each of the dioceses around the country, there are safe environment programs um, where there are procedures and policies in place so that r the opportunities for one-on-one uh, -on -one contact, hidden contact behind closed doors um, can't occur. I mean, that doesn't mean it doesn't, but, but uh, those things are set up for that. Just last year, and this has been going on for the last 15 years, 6.9 million Catholics were trained about abuse awareness. That includes educators, priests, seminarians, deacons, uh, and children with age-appropriate training. So what 
that tells us, I mean, what we've learned, and I'll get to it in the next slide, is these programs work. Awareness, absolutely, without a doubt, works in terms of recognizing behaviors of offenders and recognizing behaviors of persons who might be being abused. Background investigations are required of people who go you know, who enter the church into its ministries and its volunteers and people over the age of 18 who work with youth and of course it, its educators. The church did two million of those last year. Just as a, an aside to that, uh, when this, these programs were being implemented, one, one fellow from a diocese stood up to, to the, um, support the, the mandate and he said, you know, he said, in our diocese, we had 300 people apply for jobs in the last couple of years. 30 of them, 30 people who applied out of the 300 had sex abuse violations in their criminal histories. And they were coming to the church just like you know, uh, other predators go to youth-serving organizations. It's like Willie Sutton, the guy who robbed banks. And people said, why'd you rob banks, Willie? And he said, that's where the money is. Well, for predators, they go to where the children are. You know, whether it's Jerry Sandusky or Larry Nasser or uh, any one of these uh, cleric offenders, they go to where the, the children are, youth volunteers, coaches. Don't get me wrong. They're, the majority of people in all of those fields are good people, um, but it only takes a couple, and all your all your focus is on them. Just in the last year, there were about 364 uh, known offenders who were removed or died. Um, the, we talked about the 5,000 number, a large percentage of probably way more than half of those people are, are deceased now. And there have been settlements uh, over time in some of the states where there have been uh, statute of, statutes of limitations lifted, there have been some enormous settlements. And the biggest settlement, actually, I just read about yesterday was, and that would be not September 19th when I, that was September 19th, which is the date I, I'm sorry, I put on your, on the first slide. I do know what date it is. The settlement, uh, going back to the settlement, was in Brooklyn. And it involved three boys who had been abused over a period of years, not by a priest, but by a volunteer who was always hanging around, doing nice things for the sisters, doing nice things for the priests, and doing nice things for the kids. And he would take them to his apartment, and he would abuse them, and this went on for a number of years. When um, the church learned of it, they immediately reported it to law enforcement, but that doesn't negate the fact that there would be still liability and, and suits that came. So last year, there were about 100. $23 million in settlements to persons who'd been abused. The average over the last seven or eight years has been around $100,000, except for, I think it was 2016. In Minnesota, there were 400 new claims because of the law, the statute of limitations was lifted. The statute of limitations was lifted here in California twice for certain periods of time, windows. Uh, it's been lifted in other states. Other states are considering doing that, uh, Pennsylvania being being one of them. Um, for another discussion, there, there are lots of pros and cons to lifting statutes of limitations. And uh, all I would say is that any organization where someone has abused a child is responsible in some way, whether it's they have to be litigated or, or sued or not. And then I, I spoke to you already about the diocesan audits. Those have been going on for the last 15 years, and they will continue to go on. And um, since I was responsible for setting them up, I, I, I hope to be um, involved in making a better process now. And there's been good coordination between the religious communities and dioceses. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Catholic Church, we all tend to, tend to think a priest is a priest is a priest. There are religious communities that, um, such as the Jesuits or the Franciscans or the Benedictines, and they aren't part of dioceses. They have their own superiors, major superiors, and, and they don't report um, directly to bishops. 
And then uh, there were a couple of good studies. I'll refer you to, to them for those of you who are interested. Nature and scope of the problem of sex abuse in the Catholic Church. That was done by John Jay. And people were so pleased with their um, results that they asked John Jay to come back and do a study on the causes and context of the problem. Okay, we know what happened. Why? Why did it happen? If we don't know why, we're not going to truly be able to fix this. And you can give me my time. How am I doing on time? A little more. Okay. Well, let's just tell, tell you about causes and context because I think that's really important. John Jay did uh, an extensive study, and what they found was that there was no single cause of abuse. That there, you know, if you could find that cause, you could eliminate it. It's like if you could find the cause for breast cancer, you could eliminate it. Instead, there are multiple th factors at, at play. And because of that, you can't predict who, who necessarily is going to be an offender, although you can do some predictions of risk based on con past conduct and based on um, behavior of individuals and personality, some of their personality um, characteristics. The study did not find that there was a psychosis or something really wrong with any of these people. You cannot walk into a room uh, and pick out the sex offender. It just, it doesn't work. They don't look different. They don't necessarily act different. Uh, at least, you know, one on, you know, in the first, first setting, if you watch their behavior, you may, you may see that. And you may see a lot of uh, narcissism uh, uh, and sociopaths among. So there were, John Jay believed, a number of situational factors that allowed these these cases to occur and triggering factors. So situational factors, you have extended opportunity for the offender to be al alone with the person that they intend to abuse. You know, how does that happen? Is it after school? Is it in the classroom? Is it in classrooms with no windows on the doors? Kids. In the 60s and 70s, nobody thought anything of a child walking in and out of a rectory of a church where the priests lived. Nobody thought anything about it. It was, oh, well, maybe he's helping out, he's their friend, the mother's the housekeeper, um, they, they threw their baseball in the backyard, whatever it was. Nobody thought anything about it. So there were lots of opportunities to hide their bad acts. And then for some, not all, but for some, there were triggering factors. Alcohol abuse, drug abuse, in which the offender's um, normal filters uh, were, were gone, out of, out of control. Alcoholism, drug addiction, porn addiction, none of that is an excuse for abuse. So d please don't get me wrong about that. And I mentioned the opportunities to abuse. So just let me... Uh, wrap up a little bit here and tie this back to what you've heard about in the current crises. Some people are saying that the first crisis was about abuse, the second crisis is about leadership. There are leaders in the church who have not been held accountable for decisions that they made about offenders, about allegations, and people and organizations falter. And I can say this coming from an organization that has um, some similarities to the Catholic Church, and that's, that's the FBI. Um, and I know I'm not here to talk about, about the FBI, but I will tell you that the similarities are the fact that you, know, you have hierarchical, um, hierarchical institutions that are iconic, that are about mission. The church is about saving souls. The FBI is about saving people. And you have very committed people who are in those organizations. That doesn't mean everybody's perfect uh, by any means. But all the more reason for those people who are doing the right thing every day to uh, make sure that they adequately address the misconduct of their peers. So I could talk about integrity, I can talk about uh, a lot of different things about how, how to improve. One of the things that's important for institutions to do 
if they're going to repair, if they're going to maintain um, their status, people lose, I mean, organizations lose credibility and trust, and they have to regain it. So how do they, how do, they do that? Well, the first thing is an organization, church, whatever, you have to accept that certain things have happened that are not appropriate or wrong or criminal, whatever, whatever moniker you uh, would attach to it. You have to acknowledge that wrong occurred. You can't just keep covering up. You can't hope nobody will find out about it. There are no secrets in this society in, anymore. I mean, everything sooner or later comes out. And, you know, um, one way or the other. If you don't, if you don't believe that, um, find an email that you didn't intend to, to hit reply all on, and you know that you know there are no secrets anymore. And amendments. There has to be uh, reparation and amendments for wrongs that are done to people, whether it's civil or personal or, or in the criminal justice system. There have to be amendments. And then organizations and people within those organizations have to adapt. They have to install best practices for protecting young people, for doing the right thing, for not having misconduct in their organizations. It's a dynamic process. No organization is ever going to be perfect always. But I hope that uh, in this crisis of leadership that the, the Catholic Church will do the right thing in terms of holding, holding um, its leaders accountable for decisions that they've made. I, I feel very strongly for those of you who have relatives or friends in, in Catholic ministries that uh, go to the schools and so forth, the programs that are in place are very robust. Uh, and when they're not, if you think they're not, you have a place to report to, uh, and that's in the within the diocese or religious community. And all of this matters. All of this matters because, as I said in the beginning, I'm sorry. And yeah, and I uh, that's my last thing. Why it matters. <laughs> why, why I'm glad you listened to it for the last uh, minutes to me. Why it matters is because. Our prisons are full of boys, men and women, boys and girls, who were abused. And we could really do something as a society if we take better care of our children. So thank you all very much, and I can go some questions. It's time for our Q&A session. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you have a question. We will have two people with microphones going up and down. Uh, we can't guarantee we'll get to everyone. And please, uh, although I know many of you are tempted to ask lots and lots of FBI questions or political questions, that will be a different, uh, different symposium. So uh, let's uh, try and keep it on the issues we discussed today. And I, I will go get the mic. We have a couple here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very informative and well-presented lecture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you talked about leadership keeping them accountable. You used the term Holy See without ever mentioning the word Pope. Could you talk a little bit about accountability of the office of the Pope versus the Holy See as a uh, institution. Thank you. Sure. The question was, talking. could I talk a little bit about the accountability of the Pope versus the Holy See? Um, for many people, you know, if you're not familiar with the structure of the Catholic Church, all the bishops around the world report directly to the Pope. That's the boss. But there are, are various dicasteries, which we, we would call departments, if you will, headed by generally cardinals who deal with certain aspects of the church. They deal with conduct. They deal with liturgy. They deal with um, religious life. They deal with family life. They deal with the laity and so forth. 
some of those, you know, the Pope himself cannot run all those departments any more than a CEO can run, you know, human resources and manufacturing and planning and so forth. So he relies on those individuals who wield a lot of power, frankly, and that's what I refer to as the Holy See. Um, leadership in, in that group has not been held accountable by the lady for many reasons. Uh, some people say it's because the lady's too busy and you know there's only one Wednesday night in the week that they can go do church things or sun one Sunday or whatever. Some aren't interested. They, they're very happy with the way things are going and as long as they have their parish, they're fine. But the transparency of what they do there in the Holy See is, it, it's about as transparent as, as LAX, you know, in the middle of June at, at eight in the morning. You just can't see. And the openness, um, one of the words I used for my um, talk was secrets. There are secrets everywhere. Um, although, you know, there are some secrets that are quite open secrets, they say, rumors and so forth. So the accountability is, it's, it's a structure that we as Americans, I think, and my English speaking um, colleagues kind of don't get, we don't grasp that it doesn't work. It really doesn't work to address significant problems. It, it just doesn't. It needs to be overhauled. Hi. Uh, Over here. Oh, me? Uh, when you talk about 364 priests being removed for their actions, uh, how are you defining removed? Does that mean they're defrocked and out of the church, or does that mean they've been treated and moved elsewhere, or how would you define that? Okay, I, I still don't see the, the person I'm talking to in the back. Oh, in the back there, okay. All right, thank you. The question was, when we talk about removal of priests, um, what, what exactly does that mean? Removal does not mean they're transferred to somewhere else so they can continue in ministry. It means they've been removed from ministry. They cannot present themselves as a cleric with a, a you know, with the clerical collar. They cannot identify themselves as a priest, except within their own community, you know, within the walls of their community or with people that they that they know um, they the removal is sometimes permanent laicization um, sometimes the removal is permanent but they're not laicized and that happens when usually if the uh, offender is old or infirm and then they're placed in a prayer and penance category and they're not given any um, outside ministry at all where they could be you know at risk for for reoffending in a religious community that's easier to do because religious communities are um, they live together diocesan priests live in rectories they live in apartments they live all over the place so it's much harder to have a an offender in prayer and penance status. So in dioceses, you see people laicized, offenders laicized more often than you do in religious communities. But no, removed from ministry doesn't mean that they get to go somewhere else and have ministry. Over here? Yes. Um, the question is, is there no commonality? I'm over here. Oh, wait, wait. I gotcha. <laughs> Is there no commonality in part of the offenders? The issue, you raised the issue briefly, but never got to it, of homosexuality versus heterosexuality, whether they were abused as children, Is it, and the ages of these people. Are there no factors that are common to the offenders? The question is, are there common factors to the offenders? Uh, there are some common factors. Many of these people have had trauma in their lives, whether it is uh, a broken home situation, an abuse situation. Not every person who is abused becomes an abuser, but lots of people who are abusers have been abused. So you have to you know, keep that corollary in mind. Some of the other things that are commonalities are uh, little impulse control, lots of addictions, Porn, uh, and um, involvement with pornography, and um, a lot of narcissism. Some of the offenders, uh, frankly, are very um, popular 
people. They're very magnetic. They can groom children all day long and children, you know, flock to them because they, they like them. Most of the offenders were very personable. Homosexuality. And your question about homosexuality, as I said before, there aren't really good studies about that. Um, what John Jay, the, the John Jay st uh, study said was it was more of an opportunity because during these times, the clerics were allowed to be involved with boys uh, so much. Some of the um, offenses, especially between uh, younger priests and older boys, could be, and I'm not, I'm not the uh, psychologist to, to classify this, but they could be classified as experimentation because of the closeness of the age of the, of the cleric. And a lot of these clerics had little or no traditional sexual experience or relationships. I mean, that's a real big commonality among that group, which you expect. Sir? Pushing the button, but it's not getting here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, my question revolves around uh, what are the possibilities of, of uh, as a potential solution to the problem or an, an assistant uh, assisting the solution is feminizing the church, having women become priests, having women go into the hierarchy of the church. Uh, this is one of the solutions that I think we are trying to adapt because of our political situation that has nothing to do with the church, but I think it would be helpful in the church as well, and I wondered what your opinion would be. <laughs> that's, that's a great question, uh, a great question, uh, and, and um, maybe I have a great answer. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we can. We uh, we we hope that, and and I don't even need to call it a, a feminization of the church. But you need everybody at the table, all perspectives, what, whatever it might be. You know, uh, color, age, um, sex, whatever. You you need everybody to be involved because. You know, if you follow the church, it is the church of the people. It's not the church of the bishops or the cardinal or even the pope. It is the church of the people. And um, it's a whole other discussion as to, you know, why people like me stay, you know, and, and, and try to support um, preventing abuse um, when you have those sorts of things there. But, but as a laywoman, I did have a pretty prominent role with the Bishop's Conference. I mean, I was an executive there. Wasn't a cleric, but, um, you know, I had some authority. But you're not allowed to be a cleric yet. The well, yeah, yeah. Yes, well, that's true, and nor do I want to be, uh, actually, because, you know, it's, I, I'm not the right personality for that, but. There are some women who are. But there are some who are brilliant. Yes, absolutely, and so, yes to your question. Oh, you know, oh, all right. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. The first one, you said it ended in 1984, and I don't understand why that happened, so perhaps you can explain it. And the second thing is, what's the big brouhaha this year about 2018? I'm, I'm unclear exactly why it's come up again. Okay. Um, I didn't, when, when I talked about the abuse when it occurred, it was along kind of a, a bell curve, if you will. The peak of the cases were in the 60s, 70s, and dropped significantly in 1984. That doesn't mean there, there weren't any more cases, but, but they dropped in 19, uh, around that time, I believe, and, and John Jay kind of supports that in their study, because that was when you had better laws about abuse, you had increased abuse awareness uh, across the board, you, you began to have mandatory reporting laws uh, for clerics to report abuse, uh, and then you had um, 
well, I, I talked about ab abuse awareness, and um, children became, a, I think, a little more independent, uh, or, or uh, independent enough to stand up for themselves, to know something, something was wrong. And um, then, in many of the dioceses, there were programs, um, more oversight, uh, codes of conduct, um, training, and those sorts of things. Um, so it's definitely, even with the cases that are reported now from years back, they still fall into that bell curve of the cases. What's going on now and why it's, a, it's in the news again is because the uh, Attorney General in Pennsylvania published a huge report uh, and, and detailed all kinds of abuse that people didn't know the details before, frankly. I think most people recognized that there was a lot of abuse that occurred, but they didn't know the details. And then because one of the church leaders, Cardinal McCarrick, who had been very prominent he, in Washington, D.C., he, he um, was involved in lots of ecumenical uh, events with uh, public leaders. He was um, very well regarded in Rome. Um, it, was it was found that he had, had abused seminarians and he had abused a minor. And when that became known publicly that he had those things in his background and still the Pope, the Holy See, whatever we're going to say, continued to promote him even knowing that um, speaks volumes to cover up and um, mismanagement and criminal act. Would you come back to the effects of celibacy? Yeah. You mentioned that. So, You mentioned that celibacy uh, was not a cause of abuse, and I and I understand that. Uh, of course, some people are celibate and they don't abuse. But all you need, if you drop it, is for some portion of of the priest to develop normal relationships, and that uh, they might be less lonely. So, would you comment on whether it might make uh, a difference in reducing the child abuse if the celibacy requirement is dropped, even though I understand it may not be likely. Uh, another good question, uh, and kind of the companion question to the one about women. And the, if the, it, it is really di it's sort of difficult to say because you, you know, how, how are you gonna study, study whether or not dropping celibacy it will make a difference because you'd have to have some sort of control group to, to compare it against. But I do think that it would be a very positive thing for the church to allow that as they do in the Eastern Rite Church. I mean, there are Catholic priests in other countries who are married, have families. I, there haven't been good studies to compare whether or not there's a rate of abuse there that you know, how that might compare in the United States. But when you have offenders uh, who are celibate, it, it's, it's, um, it's complex with, with them of how they view their celibacy and so forth. But regardless, uh, that loneliness that comes sometimes with, it's, it's not just a celibacy that you're not going to have sexual intercourse, for example. It's that you can't have these relationships, these adult relationships that are age appropriate, that are nurturing, that we all need that, that kind of psychological intimacy with other people. I mean, a lot of people can get by with, with minimal or some can get by with minimal physical intimacy. But psychological and intellectual intimacy with other people, having a friend, having someone you can love, that is so fulfilling. And that, I would like to think that that would help to prevent all this misconduct, all the abuse, and all the crimes. I, I would like to think that. Is this on? Yeah. Um, getting to possibly politics in the Vatican, the accusations that this cardinal or monsignor, the name begins with a V, has made against Pope Francis, the Pope of the people, that he is continuing to cover up. And then um, 
the allegations that this accuser is making, um, they say is could could be politically motivated because Pope Francis has been trying to reform attitudes toward homosexuality. Uh, can you fill us in a little bit? Well, you're right about the fact that there is controversy about the fact that um, the former uh, ambassador from the Holy See to the United States, who is called the um, nuncio, apostolic nuncio, it's an, another word for ambassador, liaison, um, published a, a, a long 11-page letter uh, accusing the Pope of, of ignoring um, Cardinal McCarrick's um, sanctions. Um, and he, he makes a lot of accusations, some of which may be true, maybe all of it's true, maybe none of it's true. Um, I can tell you as an investigator that you have to you have to look at all of the facts. You can't just take one person's letter, or one person's statement any more than you can take, you know, an allegation of abuse. Um, you know, right off the bat, you have to go through and and corroborate different things um, and see what has happened. Are there politics in the in the Vatican and amongst the men in leadership? If there weren't, it would not be full of people. Uh, every organization that I am aware of, uh, that I've been associated with or been, uh, I've studied, and I, you know, um, I have two degrees in, in administration, public administration, so I've studied organizations inside and out. And the politics in organizations, it, it, the church isn't immune from that uh, by any means. It would be nice if it were, and as um, Sister Carol Keehan uh, often tells me, she's head of the Catholic Health Care Association, she says, look, she says, everybody's looking for perfection. Um, we're not even going to have perfection in the church or our U.S. government we're gonna, or in our health care system. She says, perfection's in heaven. But be aware that there are politics, there are other influences. And I would say, you know, wait and see how that plays out. What's really important is that they do an independent investigation. The Catholic Church has come to the point in many matters that they can't investigate themselves any longer. And they also, that they can't investigate and then not tell people the results of those investigations. Yeah, exactly. How should we assume, since it wasn't mentioned, that there is none of this with nuns, or that the incidence is so small compared that it doesn't warrant discussion? That's a very good question. He asked about, has this occurred with nuns, women are religious, and uh, are the numbers so small that you don't, they don't warrant talking about it? Um, when the bishops got together, they and, and and set up their mandates. They did not include women religious in that. Although there are cases and lawsuits and settlements involving women religious who uh, abuse children. Uh, more often, it was physical abuse than sexual abuse. So those those cases are out there. There are not large numbers of them, um, and I'm not sure why. Um, I mean, I hope it's because it, there aren't large numbers of cases. But in back in the 60s and 70s, 50s, um, there was physical abuse by some women, women religious um, that was kind of considered to be acceptable. Meaning, well, yeah, she hit you with a stick and you probably deserved it. The parents would say that and, and you know, uh, nothing would happen. Where it's more prominent, and that this is, would be a whole, other, a whole other talk, and some of you may have seen, there's a couple movies about this, but in Ireland, where all the social services for many years were provided by the Catholic Church and by women's religious groups, there was some tremendous abuse that went on. And um, that's been, you know, documented and, and codified um, here in the United States, not not so much. And the, the bishops really haven't forced the issue of doing research on it. Um, I, I don't know that you'll see it. Women religious in the United States, the numbers have dwindled 
uh, considerably since I think the peak was about 1962. And now there are very, very few of them. But it is important. I mean, I've talked to victims of, of, um, of sexual abuse of, of um, sisters, and uh, it's rare, more rare, definitely more rare. And the other thing, too, is they didn't have opportunities for sexual abuse like a priest. A priest could go get in his car, go pick up a kid, drive across state lines, go to a motel, etc. Nuns in, in those times, too, they were dressed like nuns to start with, you know. So, you know, they just didn't have those opportunities um, to be alone with children and, and, and cover it up. And they, their community, they all lived in communities anyway. They didn't live like a lot of priests, you know, two or three people in a rectory and two out of the three are gone for the weekend and, and that sort of thing. They lived with one another. So it was a much more controlled environment for sisters. Any others for? Um, I, okay. No. Yeah, I think we have time yeah, for a couple I, more. I was struck uh, by the list of characteristics of the abusers, and in one of them was that they found no psychopathology. And I'm just wondering how did they determine that? And, um, and what did they consider to be psycho psychopathology? Uh, that's a good question. What, uh, finding no indication of a psychopathology, we're talking about the very serious things like a psychosis, like this is a person who is schizophrenic, this is a person who is manic depressive, etc. Now, that said, it said, and you had a very good point in the second part of your question, which is, well, where did the information come from? And it came from the records. Um, so you could have somebody that what was had serious um, psychological problems, but um, you know it wasn't documented in the records, and, and nobody knew the person. Maybe they were deceased, etc. So the, you know they didn't find that. But what they did find were other types of antisocial behavior. And narcissism, oh, to answer a question from down here before, to add another commonality, depression and anxiety were very common among the offenders. And I, you know, there just haven't been enough studies. I, I wish there would be more studies uh, on this. But no, they're, they're, what we were referring to were really serious um, uh, situations like schizophrenia. Their it was. It was very narrow. Yes. Thank you. Next, so, next to last question. Okay. Next to last question. As a as a follow up or an add on to the question about does celibacy promote this aberrant behavior with children? Since the four percent of priests who had uh, apparently behaved poorly, as you put it, and the in the public is at large four percent are. Um, people who have molested children. Has there been any study correlating the patterns or the, the marriage or uh, domesticity of the people at large as opposed to the priests? I mean, are, are they celibate or were they unmarried versus the priests who were always unmarried and supposed to be celibate? And the, the question has to do with, uh, you know, offenders in general, whether or not they are, you know, what kind of situations are they in? Are they all, you know, single guys who are, you know, uh, live under a, a tree somewhere or the freeway. Um, the, the information is that most sex abusers, adult sex abusers, are in adult relationships, whether with another man or another woman. Mostly it's, I mean, a woman. Mostly it's a woman. And mostly, it's, you know, we're talking about male offenders here. But that that's the, what the studies say. Now, the quality of that relationship is, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't think the studies go into the, the depth of, of that. Last what question. Was the last one? Hi. Right yes. here. Uh, I have two really short questions. The first is that you mentioned that date of 1984, and one of the things you said was you said that children became a little more, uh, had more agency, maybe, you know. Um, I wonder, I, and growing up in the uh, six, late 50s, 60s, going to Catholic school, I, I wonder, there's probably maybe some people in the room, in those days, 
the priest was like you said earlier, the representative of God on earth, or Christ on earth. And I know my own family was very deferential to priests. And as you said, a lot of times with abuse, people would say, oh, they, you know, they're making up stories, it's the priest. So I'm wondering if that also changed in the 70s and 80s in terms of families and parenting and society. You know, that's one. And the second, real quick, um, is can you speak to any of the programs that are being used in parishes to keep people um, uh, um, kind of um, engaged in understanding what when abuse occurs and um, how to how to you know how to deal with it? Uh, thank you for those uh, last two. The first one has to, has to do with you know what's changed what's changed in the in the family situation, the school situation. First of all, there aren't as many Catholic schools as there were, you know, when you and I were growing up. Uh, there, there just aren't, so there's, there's fewer opportunities for that. It used to be that there was a lot of relationships between the offenders and the family of the victim. They were, they were related in many cases. You know, you have a lot of, there are a lot of cases of, of the priest abuser abusing a niece or a nephew. And then um, other social relationships where you would invite the priest over for dinner or, or why don't you come on vacation with us or why don't you, you know, uh, picnic with us, what, whatever it is. Uh, those kinds of relationships are very few and far between now and have faded over time. Maybe it's a cultural thing. Maybe it's because there are fewer priests. Maybe because, you know, we don't have local parishes that we get connected with and so forth. But for whatever reasons, and I think, you know, in other faiths you see a lot of that as well, that they're, you're just not as connected with the clerics as, as you were in the past. So that that's one. And your second question was in parishes, and for those of you that don't know, you know, it's mandated training on abuse awareness for volunteers and teachers and educators. And each diocese can select, you know, their own program. Some of it's off the shelf, some of it's very Catholic oriented, some of it's very secular, some of it's um, online. And the, you know, there's just a variety of programs. Most of the country, most of the country uses one or two. Um, you know, they use a Virtus program or they use a, a Presidium program. And um, here in the Archdiocese of, of LA, I, I think they're I think they're in Virtus. And um, it, every adult should go to these classes. It doesn't matter if you're part of a church or you never see a, a young person, you should know what abuse looks like and how to help someone who might be being abused or how to identify a predator. It's just one of those things we should all know. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. McChesney. Thank you very much. <laughs>